So, um, yeah, welcome to this uh, short introduction to quantum computing. Uh, we will have a few sessions uh, and my main aim here is to give you some uh, intuition. So we will discuss the basic mathematical tools that we need. We will discuss uh, some quantum computing algorithms. Uh, I have uh, three uh, examples uh, here in this. Yeah, maybe in the first session we can do one example. And I also like to add a little bit of programmer's view. Uh, I did a lot of programming in other languages, C++, Java, functional languages. And um, I, I also would like to comment uh, how is quantum computing uh, different from maybe the stuff you already know? So the main aim in the lecture is really to give you an intuition. So maybe at some places I'm not 100% precise. I, I then have maybe a footnote on that. Uh, the important thing is that you understand how quantum computing algorithms work and how do they differ from classical uh, algorithms? Uh, really, when I when I was well a little bit further away from the topic, I had a little bit of the impression: okay, it's just um, uh, the same stuff, but maybe it's a little bit more efficient because he can do everything in parallel. And also there's a misconception that he can represent instead of two states, he can represent a continuum of states. And actually this is a misconception. And uh, I really like to explore this a little bit. And uh, after we have looked at some algorithm, we also understand that it is more a duality. Yeah? It is a, a completely dual approach. And in some cases, the quantum computing algorithms really perform much better. And in other cases, they have disadvantages. So here are a few things that you maybe already heard. Yeah, All operations in the quantum computer are linear operators, unitary operators, followed by a measurement. Uh, and the operations have to be invertible. Uh, and um, operations can be performed in superposition in parallel as long as you do not perform the measurement. So maybe these things are already known and we like to explore this a little bit more deeper. So I start here with a section uh, recalling some mathematical concepts. So um, what is a Hilbert space? What is a tensor space? How does the tensor space differ from the Cartesian product. So the tensor product differs from the Cartesian product. Uh, so I like to recall this a little bit and then we uh, will stumble across the possibility that we can model entanglement in the tensor space. I will shortly mention unitary operators, Schrodinger equation and quantum states. And then I will repeat a few of these concepts again here in this section on quantum uh, computing. So the things that are relevant uh, for us. So let's start. Yeah, we consider an n-dimensional Hilbert space over the complex numbers. Yeah, so here it is over C. Okay, I'm sure you know a complex number. So it has a real part, an imaginary part, and there's also the polar uh, representation. Um, well, for, for actual our lecture and also for the quantum computing, it's maybe here enough to only look at a finite dimensional space. And our space has a scalar product. So we can, we have a bilinear form here to uh, assign uh, two elements here, um, a number in C. Um, so in quantum computing, you often have the so-called bracket notation. So there is um, a so-called pra vector, so denoted by that guy, and there is a ket vector denoted by that guy. So I would say then pra psi 
cat phi. Huh? Sometimes I just say psi or phi. Um, and also this is mathematically not 100% precise. You can think of the two guys as being um, a row vector. Huh? So the pra vector is here a row vector and the cat vector is a column vector. So if I write pra cat, that's just the scalar product. Yeah. So you see also the symbols uh, are uh, fused together to form the scalar product. Uh, and really uh, a row times column is the scalar product if you have a matrix multiplication. Uh, it's mathematically not 100% precise because actually the notation is independent of choosing a basis where this uh, notation with the row vector and column vector requires that we agree on some uh, basis. Okay, but apart from that, that's maybe the nice uh, intuition. Then I can represent in my Hilbert space um, a state yeah, or an element, a vector. Uh, I can represent a vector in terms of basis vectors. So I, if I have an n-dimensional space here, yeah, so then I can choose an orthonormal basis, yeah, orthogonal and uh, normed vectors from my Hilbert space say for example here p1 to pn. So this is here an orthonormal basis. And I can represent then any state, any vector in my Hilbert space in terms of this basis. Okay, that I also assume you already know. A special case is a two-dimensional space. And in a two-dimensional space, I could think of having two basis vectors. And now there is maybe a little bit strange notation here. Um, I call the vectors first vector or second vector. And since I'm a programmer, uh, I start counting at zero. So I call it vector zero and vector one. Uh, so I just call the two states cat zero and cat one. Well, actually these are maybe just names. Yeah? You can think of them just uh, as being names. So I have here, two orthonormal basis vectors, uh, which are cat zero and cat one. And then this means I can represent any state, any vector in my two dimensional space. I can represent it in terms of this basis. So I have that phi is some complex number C1 cat zero plus some complex number C2 times uh, cat, cat one. Um, and now a unit vector is called a qubit. So we have our first definition that links to quantum computing. I will repeat it later. So definition one, a qubit is a normed state in this two dimensional Hilbert space. So I have that absolute value squared C1 plus absolute values squared C2 is equal to one. And maybe you also remember that you can interpret here these guys as being the probability yeah, to observe yeah, later measure the state in either cat zero or cat one. I will come to this. So really from that definition, you would think that the qubit is somehow a continuum of states but we will have to maybe fix this interpretation a little bit. The pra vector, so now there was only the cat vector, actually represents some uh, linear map. So our pra vector cat psi represents here a linear map. Well, which linear map is that? So every vector cat phi used as an argument to this map. So now I use here the notation function of an argument uh, is assigned to the scalar product. So I just have here the scalar product. So I can interpret pra phi as a linear map that is given by the uh, scalar product. 
And then comes another notation that we will uh, sometimes see. So we will sometimes see the notation cat phi pra psi. Okay, so that means I multiply the linear map from the left Yeah. So if you now go back to this interpretation that it is a column vector times a row vector, that is a matrix. Yeah? It is the matrix where you multiply every element with every element. Uh, and actually this is a projection, at least if the Psi is a unit vector, uh, it means that this linear map is a rank one uh, linear map that maps the Psi to the Phi. Huh? Because if you multiply some say element here uh, from the uh, right, yeah? so you would have something like here a G, say here G to the right, then it means the scalar product of Psi with G in the multiplied with the Phi, so it is how much do you have in the direction of Psi assigned to Phi? Um, and if you would multiply with Psi, yeah, you would have cat Phi times one. Yeah? So you just get the Phi. Okay, so we will sometimes see this. And if you see this, you can just think of, it will map the Psi to the Phi. So next important concept, which we need is the tensor space. Um, if I have two Hilbert spaces, yeah, they could be at the moment N and M dimensional. So let's call these spaces here, say H1 and H2. So they are two Hilbert spaces. So the first one has dimension N and the second one has dimension M. Then I can take two orthonormal bases in these spaces. So let's call the bases in H1 PI and the bases in uh, H2, I call it Q, QJ. Okay. Then the space that is formed by all formal sums, Cij, and then some symbol, yeah? that's also just, just a name, yeah? a symbol, a Pi tensor product Qj, this is called the tensor space. Okay, so you see from this definition, I combine every basis vector in one space with every basis vector in the other space, and I have assigned a coefficient to it. So the tensor space consists of all possible combinations of the states in H1 and H2. Important aspect is the dimension of the space is N times M. So note that the dimension of the tensor product here is, is the product of the dimensions. So if you combine more and more states, the dimension will grow exponentially. Yeah? So it grows quite large. We have certain obvious rules in this tensor space. So if I multiply one element with a scalar, yeah, okay, then I can move that factor in front. And it's also the same as multiplying here another element. So I have some laws, yeah, how to operate with some, some distributive laws. And I can also define a scalar product. So if I have uh, F1 tensor product G1 and F2 tensor product G2, then I just define the scalar product as um, uh, the product of the individual scalar products. Also note that, for example, if you now consider only unit vectors, that will mean that the tensor product of unit vectors is a unit vector, yeah? Because you will um, multiply then a one with, with, with a one, yeah? So, and um, also um, you get some uh, thing with um, orthogonality. So given a single Hilbert space and we take the tensor product with itself, for example, n times. Uh, then I use here the notation h to the power of 
tensor product n. Right? So this is just h taking the tensor product with itself n times. And from what we just saw, yeah, this is all combinations of all states in each individual space. So the dimension of this guy is the dimension of h to the power of n. So if h is, for example, our simple two-dimensional space formed by the states zero and one, then the dimension of this guy goes as two to the power of n. Uh, you surely know the Cartesian product of subspaces. So how does the tensor product or tensor space compare to the Cartesian product or Cartesian product space? So if you take the Cartesian product of two spaces, so like in the previous slide, yeah, so now I have here the Cartesian product of H1 and H2 with P and Q being the basis. Uh, then you just take the basis in one state and zero in the other state and the basis in the other state and zero in the um, first state to create a basis in the Cartesian product. And you see that the dimension of the Cartesian product space is N plus M and the dimension of h to the power of n, which is, is just the n times Cartesian product, is just n times dimension of h. So the tensor space is much richer. No? So we would have in the tensor space p1, q1, 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 no? so with all q1s, and then repeated with q2 and so on, all combinations. So that space is much richer. And what is this additional stuff that we can model in this uh, space? So in the Cartesian product, the two coordinates are independent. You choose your basis in, in one space, you choose your coordinates in one space, and you choose the coordinates in the other space. So you can describe a state actually by the two individual sets of coordinates. And the important word here is maybe the word independent. So you take coordinates AI and BJ in the two states, and that describe you the state and Cartesian product. Uh, such a state would correspond to a coordinate CIJ in the tensor space, uh, where CIJ is of a special form, AI times BJ. Okay, just, just uh, factor this out. I mean, you can take one vector in one space. So I have something like a i p i in the first state uh, space. And then I take the tensor product of this guy with something I see in the second space. So j from one to m, b j, Q, J. And then we, if you go back to our rules, you see that this is actually um, a C, I, J, all combinations P, I times Q, J, where these combinations here are just, okay, so you just multiply these guys out, yeah, so they come always with the corresponding basis vector. This here is just A, I times BJ. So it has a special structure. So you can think of in the tensor space of uh, two subspaces, you write the coefficient as a matrix. And then the stuff in the Cartesian product is just a special subset of matrices, namely the matrix here, A times B transposed, huh? column times O. Before we look at this, let me add now um, the next definition that links to quantum computing, a quantum register. So a quantum register is a unit vector from the tensor space created by the qubits. Okay, so we have our simple two-dimensional Hilbert space here. 
And I call the basis vectors cat zero, cat one. Recall that a unit vector from this space is called a qubit. And now we define a quantum register as being an unit vector from the n times tensor product h, tensor product h, and so on. So this guy is called a quantum register. So then I can define a basis. So the states q1 tensor product, q2 tensor product, and so on, qn, where the q's can be zero and one, denote an orthonormal basis of this space. So maybe this is not 100% not nicely written. This means the basis is formed by all these combinations. Yeah? So cat zero, tensor product cat zero, and so on, tensor product cat zero is one basis vector. And then zero, 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 one is the another basis vector. Uh, so our basis is given by, say, combining all the unit vectors from our two-dimensional space. So, and we get here many, many different uh, combinations. Yeah, so for example, also that guy. Oops. and so on. Yeah? So how many combinations do you have? Okay, you know, it's binary, it's two to the power of n. Okay, that's just the dimension of this space. So I will sometimes use um, a short notation. So I will sometimes omit the O times, yeah, the tensor product symbol, and I will just write Q1 to Qn or since I'm a programmer, I start counting in zero. I will write Q0 to Qn minus one, something like that. Uh, so for example, uh, if I write cat zero one zero, that's actually the basis vector formed by cat zero tensor product cat one tensor product cat zero. It's just a name for the basis vector. You can think of it as being a label. Okay, that's a quantum register. And the quantum register comes from a two to the power of n dimensional space. It's the analog to the classical register. Let's again look at the comparison between Cartesian product and tensor product, or now classical versus quantum register. In a classical computer, a register, so say eight bytes, for example, combining eight bits, yeah, is indeed um, an element of the Cartesian product of the individual bits. Okay. So in my tensor uh, space here, my quantum register is now an element of the tensor space. So there is a, a, a difference in the dimension. And I mentioned that the tensor space is somewhat larger. Yeah? So we have this special structure AIBJ, but we can have more elements. And what is this additional stuff that is in the tensor space? And this is that the physical system, so quantum mechanics has or can have a property which is called entanglement, which is actually linked to some kind of correlation no? or there is a link between elements. So elements may not be independent. And it is this not being independent. I mentioned that uh, Cartesian product is a little bit like having independent coordinates. This not being independent this is the stuff that I can model in the tensor space. So if we, for example, interpret the square, absolute value square of the coefficient of a normed vector as probabilities, you know, that 
the probability that the corresponding basis state is attained, yeah, or say better, measured, yeah, then we can rephrase this difference as being um, a difference yeah, between Cartesian product and tensor product. This is a difference between independence and correlation. So a nice example, assume we like to model that in, in our two-dimensional space, so we have two two-dimensional spaces, say H1 and H2, uh, both have here the basis vectors labeled by cat zero and cat one. Assume that in both spaces, I can be with probability one half in cat zero and one half in cat one. So we are with probability one half in one of these states. My tensor space has the four basis vectors, zero, zero, which is cat zero tensor product cat zero, zero, one, one, zero, one, one. Okay, these are just the names for the basis vectors. And if the two events are independent, then this corresponds in the tensor space to the vector one over square root of four, one, 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 one. Indeed, if you just take here a vector that is with probability one half in zero and one half in one, uh, in our interpretation, uh, in one space, and you take the tensor product of that guy with a corresponding vector in the other space, then you can just multiply this out. Yeah? So you get from the other space here, the second bit. And from the first space, I get the first bit and one over square root of two multiplied with one over square root of two is this one over square root of four. But in my tensor space, I can also have the following situation that I, see the vector one, zero, zero, one. And since it is a normed vector, it's one divided by square root of two. So that would correspond to being with probability one half in the state zero, zero, and being with probability one half in the state one, one. If you now see each state individually, so you just do not look at the second component, you see that it is with probability one half in zero and with probability one half in one, but you also have a correlation. So we have the same situation as before. We see probability one half state zero and probability one half state one in both spaces, but there is a link between the two. When we observe in space one, state zero, then we know that we are also in this state zero in the second space. So there's the correlation between the two systems. And since this correlation exists in the physical system, we try to make use of this. And the quantum computer makes use of this and this property is called um, entanglement. So this means we work in the tensor space because we have physical systems that have this degree um, of freedom. So now we have two concepts, uh, the qubit, a very small element uh, from a small um, Hilbert space and the quantum register, uh, an element from a much larger space the tensor space of qubits. And we now like to describe operations that modify these guys. So the things we have to look for are unitary operators. So the definition of a unitary operator assume we have a Hilbert space here with a certain norm. 
then a unitary operator is a linear operator and it's called unitary. If it maps unit vectors to unit vectors. So for a vector phi, actually I should have used maybe a cat phi, yeah, but sometimes I just use the mathematician's notation, yeah, so without the symbols um, cat and pra, and sometimes I use the physicist or quantum physicist notation. So for a unit vector phi, uh, I have that u phi is uh, a unit vector. So this also means that the map is invertible yeah, because it cannot map something to zero yeah, because or some subspace to zero because then I have uh, can find a unit vector that is mapped to zero. So unit uh, unitary operators are linear maps that map unit vectors to unit vectors. And why is that important for us? Okay, we see that the qubit is a unit vector from the two-dimensional space. Uh, the quantum register is a tensor product of such unit vectors, and hence it is also a unit vector. So a quantum register is a unit vector. So unitary operators preserve this property. They map quantum registers to quantum registers. So this is the operation that we can make on the quantum register. Okay, so maybe that's a bit disappointing. We can only make linear operations here, but um, the advantage is that the space is so large. Maybe a short uh, comment, uh, the link to physics, uh, the Schrodinger equation. So if you have a quantum system and you have in this quantum system some state, yeah? so let's call this here cat phi and the state depends on time. Yeah? So maybe it's the wave function that evolves in this space, uh, in this system. Yeah? Then you know that this state evolves. So evolves means that it has here a time derivative. This state evolves according to the Schrodinger equation. Okay, so this looks like an ODE. Uh, so there is some operator H, um, H hat here called the Hamiltonian. So the formal solution of this equation, yeah, so the formal solution is just that this phi here is exponential minus I uh, Hamiltonian times T divided by H bar uh, times the initial uh, state. Huh? So this is how my space, uh, my state evolves in this system. And the Hamiltonian is a, a self um, a joint um, operator. And if H head is self-adjoint, this means that the exponential that is here in front of the initial state is a unitary operator. So you see that in the physical system, uh, states um, transform into new states by unitary operators. So implementing the quantum computer is then somehow to create the system uh, in a way such that it evolves with the desired unitary operator. If you think that your computer has a certain frequency, a certain uh, schedule, you can think of say t time discretization. And then this equation describes the transition to a new state. And if you then think of this transition here is the unitary operator ui that I define over the time interval from ti to ti plus one, you see that I have a new state is the previous state times a unitary operator. 
And now we define a set of such operators, uh, very simple operators, elementary operators uh, that transform certain states, certain quantum registers, quantum registers, certain values to new states. And these are guys are called quantum gates. So this is my section on the mathematical concepts. And in the section, I had three links to quantum computing. I had the definition of the qubit. I had the definition of the quantum uh, register. And this here is now the third link. It's the quantum gate. It is linked to the unitary operators. So quantum gates are just unitary operators. So quantum gates are just unitary operators acting on quantum registers. They are the analog to what you know from maybe computer science that you can have very elementary operations on your bits. You can have an AND, uh, a NOR, a NOT AND, an OR, an XOR. So they are the analog to classical binary grades, but there are some important differences. So for example, some classical operators do not exist. For example, an AND yeah, does not exist because they are not invertible. Yeah? An AND maps uh, 0, 0 to 0, 0, 1 to 0, 0, uh, 1, 0 to 0, and 1, 1 to 1. This is not invertible. So a unitary operator is invertible. So somehow we have to uh, construct the guys in a way that they are invertible. We will see later that you can always achieve this by maybe adding more dimensions. It's already then a nice thing that illustrates the difference to classical computers. You may need here more memory to ensure that stuff is invertible. Uh, but also new operators exist, which can create entanglement and they do not have a classical counterpart you know, because we have these probabilities of being in different states. Okay, so that was my first little tour through some mathematical concepts that we need. Yeah? Most important one is maybe the tensor space. And now let's restart and look at how we use these things in quantum computing. So first thing to repeat, qubit and quantum register. A qubit is a normed unit vector of a two-dimensional Hilbert space over C. So denoting here my basis vector is say cat zero and cat one, I can describe the qubit by alpha cat zero plus beta cat one, where I have the condition that alpha absolute value squared plus beta absolute value squared is equal to one, yeah, because it's a unit vector. And now you see that from this property, we can interpret actually this guy here as the probability that the state is in cat zero. So how much, uh, how much of cat zero is inside my state psi? Well, this is an interpretation. And actually uh, a little bit more precise is that it reflects the probability that we measure, so we perform a measure, the state in cat zero. So in the end, you cannot observe alpha and beta. You can perform a measurement on this state and then the outcome will be only one of the two. So if you make a measurement, you only observe zero or you only observe one. So these two do not exist as um, a linear combination after the measurement. But if you repeat this measurement, 
then you will see the coefficient or the absolute value squared of the coefficient as the probability that you observe the cat zero. So we have somewhat access to this probability. Uh, maybe a better word for this situation is that we have superposition. So the state is here in superposition. We have a certain amount of cat zero and a certain amount of cat one in superposition. And the coefficients reflect here the probability that we are, or better that we measure that the state is in observed in cat zero with probability alpha squared and in cat one with probability beta absolute values squared. So the qubit can be in superposition. So it appears to be simultaneously in both state and the measurement will, will reveal one state with a certain probability. Maybe from this, there comes the misconception that in a quantum computer, you have a continuum instead of two values, yeah? but it's not a continuum. It is still two values, zero or one, but they occur uh, a little bit fuzzy. Yeah? They occur with certain probabilities. Um, and it's this difference, which I would like to make clear during this lecture, uh, that we will work on these probabilities in a very, very nice way. So just what I said, it is a misconception to see um, a superposition as a continuum um, of states. So sometimes you may encounter the view that in a quantum computer, a qubit can take a continuum of values where a classical computer can take only two. Yeah? And this is, this is a misconception. So the qubit also has only two states, but it can attain these two states simultaneously in a superposition. And the final measurement will then result of one of the two states with a certain uh, probability. So this now maybe prompt a nice question If we have to perform a measurement at the end that singles out a classical state, so in the end we only get zero or one, like in a classical computer, what is then the advantage of a quantum computer? So I make all these calculations, and in the end I single out a classical state. So it looks a little bit, if I go back, everything is classical. So what's the difference? I hope I can give you an answer doing the lecture, maybe not already in this session, yeah, maybe a first idea in this session, uh, answer will uh, come a little bit later. A thing which I have to mention is the face. So we are in a two dimensional Hilbert space over C. So viewing the imaginary and the real part separately over C, you can identify this guy as being R4. Yeah? So we have four real coefficients. If you write now the complex number in polar coordinates, then you have two parameters, R for my two um, complex numbers of the two dimensional space. And I have two parameters, phi, the angle um, of my two complex numbers. The phi is called the face. So now I'm in a um, two dimensional Hilbert space. So I could write any element as being R zero e to the I phi zero plus R one e to the I phi one multiplied with the respective basis vectors, cat zero and cat one. Since the qubit is a unit vector, this is a restriction and one R goes away. Actually, I just have R zero 
So this is due to being a unit vector. It can be described in R to the power of three, say by one R zero, okay, between zero and one. The other one is then square root of one minus R zero squared and two faces. And now we have that in a quantum system, we perform a measurement. So actually we cannot measure the phase. Uh, but if you have unitary operators at hand, you can measure the relative phase. You cannot measure the absolute phase. So the phase of both. So this singles out one phase. Um, and this means that a qubit can be described by an element in R2. So I have one R0 parameter and maybe one phase and the R0, I can represent it as a cosine of some angle theta half. So if I now have the convention that the uh, coefficient of cat zero is real and non-negative, then my most general Uh, so under this restriction, under this con convention, my mo most general representation would be of this form. And this is um, a sphere. Yeah? So a two-dimensional surface here in a three-dimensional space. So this can be interpreted as the Bloch sphere. Uh, I do not have pictures of this. I do not need it. But in a later session yeah, by Daniel, There, there will be, um, um, this will come up again. Yeah, so you can have a nice uh, representation of the qubit. Yeah, so where you have here individual uh, states here and in then you have something in between here and it can also rotate with a certain, with a certain face. And due to this interpretation, some operators are called rotations. So that was the qubit. Recall the quantum register. So since a qubit represents a basis in the two-dimensional uh, space, yeah, um, the tensor space formed by n qubits is dimension of the original space to the power of n. Yeah, we saw this. So this is two to the power of n. So this tensor space formed by n qubits is a two to the power of n dimensional space. And uh, we call a unit vector from this two to the power of n dimensional space, a quantum register. So a quantum register is a unit vector, a normalized vector from that two to the power of n dimensional space formed by the tensor product of the n qubits. So this space is huge, yeah? I mean, for n equals 20, yeah, we have millions of, of, of uh, basis vector. So the quantum register can be in superposition two. So it can be in the same sense, yeah? So with the same interpretational remarks in these states simultaneously in superpositions. Well, the coefficient in front, the square, absolute value square of the coefficient in front of a basis vector is associated with the probability that I observe, that I measure the quantum register in this state. Maybe these examples here are also nice. Consider, for example, a, a tensor space formed by four qubits. So one of the basis vectors is cat one, tensor product, cat zero, tensor product, cat zero, tensor product, cat one. And you have all, yeah, tensor space is 
the formal sum of all combinations. You have all combinations you know, of the other basis vectors. And I already mentioned, I sometimes then use the short notation, cat1001 for this element. And you see that this looks here then like having um, a classical binary number that denotes my basis vector from the tensor space. So the quantum register is a superposition of all those possible classical values. So for three qubits, I have two to the power of three. So that's two times two, four, two times two, eight. Yeah? So I have eight basis vectors. So for the three times tensor product, I have these basis vectors here forming the tensor space of the quantum register. And now I can have a superposition. So I can have a sum, say sum uh, CI times uh, PI, whatever you call these guys now. Yeah. And um, you can observe the quantum register with a certain probability in one of these states. Then you find the nice little notation that you identify now the binary sequence that you observe on top with an integer X. So for example, this guy here is yeah, now it depends little endian, big endian. Yeah, where is your least significant bit? Yeah? So this guy here is one times two to the power of zero. So this here is one. This here is the two. This here is two plus one, it's the three. Yeah, so zero, one, one, it's the three. So you can identify these integer sequences that are just a short notation for which basis vectors are combined to form the basis vector of the tensor space, you can identify them with an integer number. So this is my integer number X. And then I can use the even shorter notation, the strange even shorter notation, cat X. So this means, for example, I just write cat three for cat zero one one. And I just write cat nine for the space where I have a four times tensor product with the um, basis vectors one, zero, zero, one combined to a tensor product. Now that we have this notation, we can define the quantum register being in superposition as being the linear combination with these basis states, basis vectors, uh, CI, cat I, and cat I is now cat zero in the sense that it is zero, 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 and so on. So we can now have this nice, very short notation here. And you see that we have a two to the power of n dimensional space. So I have two to the power of n coefficients in this superposition here. So I have two to the power of n probabilities, actually, since the sum of the uh, CI absolute value squared sums up to once, they are two to the power of n minus one degrees of freedom with respect to these uh, probabilities. So that's a huge space. And you can think of that the quantum register represents all possible values in this of the classical register uh, simultaneously with a certain probability. No? Also just an interpretation because it is the probability that we measure the register being in one of the basis states, uh, which is we measure each individual qubit uh, and get for each individual qubit the corresponding value. But note that in entanglement is encoded inside. Yeah? Without entanglement, we would have much less degrees of freedom. 
So now we had again qubit quantum register. We saw also the superposition and have this nice notation. And next thing in the quantum computing is the quantum gates. So recall the quantum gate is a linear operator being unitary. So maps unit vectors to unit vectors, maps quantum registers to quantum register. So since this operator preserves the property um, of normalization, we stay in the space of quantum registers and it is also uh, invertible. So we can always reverse uh, the um, operation. And now comes the special form of parallelism that you have in a quantum computer. So he can do things in parallel, but in a certain sense. And really the parallelism is really different from the parallelism we have if you have multi-threaded computers or GPUs, single instruction, multiple data. Um, I, can, I can comment a little bit more on this. So what's the parallelism here? So if I have a quantum register in superposition, so here in my two to the power of n dimensional tensor space. So then my most general representation is that this is the sum Cx cat x. So x is now an integer running from zero to two to the power of n minus one. Cat x is enumerating, labeling all my autonormal basis states and Cx is the corresponding um, coefficient. We are absolute value. Cx squared is the probability that I measure the state being in cat x. So it's a unit vector. I have here this additional uh, condition. So now applying the unitary operator u to this state, so to my state cat psi. Well, my unitary operator is a linear operator. So I can take the sum out and I can take the scalar multiplication out with the Cx. And I see that this guy is just the sum Cx you apply to the basis state. So you see that the superposition is preserved. So if I have an operator that maps X to a different value, then if I now use the superposition state, I will get the superposition of all results. So he's performing all the u axes in parallel. So in this sense, yeah, the operation is performed on all two to the power of n states simultaneously. But note that superposition is set just associated with the probability to measure in a certain space, a certain state. Uh, if you would have a classical state that is with pro a certain probability one in a, in a certain state, that looks a little bit like um, you just have a classical path. Yeah? Uh, but that is not true because we can have unitary operator that create superposition. So actually the unitary operators maps probabilities to different or also new probabilities. We will see this later. Yeah? So this here can also be a little bit misleading, but this is the way we understand the parallelism in the quantum computer. So maybe a small summary, an, ob uh, an obvious uh, limitation, yeah, or it appears a little bit as a limitation that we are restricted to unitary um, operators. Um, and an obvious advantage is that we have some kind of uh, parallelism 
by uh, superposition. Uh, another um, advantage is that we have a huge dimension. So it's two to the power of n. Huh? Um, and I have a comment that this way of parallelism is different from what you have in classical computers later. Some simple examples for such quantum gates. So quantum gates, just unitary operator. Uh, also the corresponding thing to um, a classical computer. So the not gate is operating on a single qubit and it maps just zero to one and one to zero. So it just flips the coefficients of the a, a superposition state. So if you would like to write it as a matrix in your basis, cat zero, cat one, um, it's just the matrix zero, one, one, zero. So that's a unitary operator. So it will map cat zero to cat one and it maps cat one to cat zero. If you apply it twice, you get the identity. Uh, then on a two dimensional space, we have the, for example, the conditional knot. So given by this matrix, so what's the conditional knot doing? Okay, maybe just write it down. It will map zero, zero to zero, zero. Uh, yeah, there's an identity here. There's another identity here. It will map uh, zero, one to zero, one. So now this is the order in which I uh, label uh, my um, my basis vectors. So my basis vectors are zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one, which you could name cat zero, cat one, cat two, cat three, if you take the other notation. Uh, so, and then you see that uh, now for the other two, it does um, a not operator. So one zero is mapped actually to one one and one one is mapped to one zero. So the second is mapped to the third and the third is mapped to the second. So you see, you have a small knot operator here and it is called conditional knot because you have here a condition. So if the first guy is one, it will make, so that's the condition, it will apply um, a knot on the on the second one, a conditional knot. Huh? So a nice um, unitary um, operator. And I already had the remark that we cannot have an end yeah, because it will map a two dimensional space to a one dimensional space, the end. Yeah? So uh, such a thing does not exist because it's not invertible. These were fairly simple operators. And I now have also a list of more um, simple operators. Well, there is a theorem that you can approximate um, an arbitrary unitary transformation U up to a certain accuracy by a sequence, a repeated sequence of simple unitary transformations. So we have here this result that we can approximate you by concatenating simple unitary uh, approximation up to some error where uh, a simple transformation is just a transformation that only operates on 
two qubits, yeah, two qubits in my quantum registers. Which one yeah, could be different? There's a lot of identity in my matrix, and then there's some place where something is going on. Like for example, C naught, yeah, is operating on two qubits. So it's maybe enough to only build up my system with these simple uh, transformations. So let's go through a list of some standard quantum gates. You will see this also maybe later in, in um, a hands-on coding session. Uh, so maybe I go just go quickly through this. The NOT gate, I already described it. It maps zero to one and one to zero. And uh, we will later see um, circuits that draw pictures of our transformations. So instead of writing the NOT gate Instead of specifying here what, what is going on with this ugly matrix, we will draw and then concatenate the matrices. We will draw nice pictures. And there is a certain standard uh, how you draw these pictures. And the NOT gate is the NOT gate is usually here depicted by uh, this symbol, yeah, this cross yeah, or an X can also be uh, interpreted as a certain uh, rotation. We will see this, uh, you will see this later in another session. So that is the NOT gate. And now a very important non-classical operation, the Hadamard gate, the gate that is creating uh, superposition out of basis vectors. So we map zero to zero one uh, and one to zero minus one multiplied with the norming factor one divided by square root of two. So the unitary matrix is one, one, one minus one multiplied with one divided by square root of two. And these superpositioned states sometimes have the label cat plus yeah, and cat minus. Yeah. They are also an auto normal basis. So the Hadamard gate brings a single uh, qubit into superposition. And the Hadamard gate is usually depicted here with this H. Yeah, now an interesting thing, what happens if you apply uh, many Hadamard gates to every qubit of a quantum register? So I have a quantum register and I apply a Hadamard gate to every qubit. Let's have um, a look at this. So assume that we have here a state cat x so cat X is now a basis state. Uh, so it is labeled here with my bits, uh, Q0, Q1, and so on, Qn minus one. So here I have my bits. And now I'm applying a Hadamard gate to the quantum register in the sense that I apply the Hadamard gate to each qubit. So that means I look at the tensor product of UH cat QI, where, where uh, or here, cat QJ. So since we, since we sometimes need the I for the imaginary, yeah, uh, I hopefully try to use always J, not to confuse you. Um, so the tensor product of applying the Hadamard gate to the bit QJ. So what's that? Okay, so if the QJ is a zero, we will get one divided by square root of two, cat zero plus cat one. So if the QJ is zero, I will actually get zero, plus cat one with a coefficient of one. And if the QJ is one, I will get cat zero minus 
cat one. Multiplied with one divided by square root of two. So I get in any case cat zero plus minus to the power of uh, qj. So minus one to the power of qj, which is my coefficient plus or minus depending on the input bit. Okay, so cat one. And I get this uh, uh, tensor, tensor product. So now I multiply this tensor product out. So what I get here is I get all possible combinations of zero and one with a certain coefficient. So how many combinations do we have? We have two to the power of n combinations. Okay, and we have zero, 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 okay, which has a coefficient of one. We could also have zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, which has a coefficient. Okay, which coefficient does this have? So it has a coefficient of minus one whenever the original guy here contributed a minus one. And when I'm looking at the corresponding bit. So that means you count the number of bits where the input state and the state that you are looking at of all possible output combination have a one in common. So this is the number of binary bits that you have in X and Y, yeah? So binary and operator on the register or the number of common binary bits in X and Y. And if this number is even, I have a plus one. If this number is odd, I have a minus one. Okay, that's a very strange uh, quantum register superposition. Yeah. Sometimes we have a plus one, sometimes we have a minus one. Uh, and there's already now a thing here inside that links to getting a better intuition for what is uh, the feature of this quantum computer. We always thought that the coefficient in front of this state, so the guy that is here, is associated with the probability to measure this state. Well, this is true for the absolute value squared of this guy and the absolute value squared of this guy is always one. Yeah, uh, one divided by two to the power of n means that I observe every state with equal probability. But in this superposition, the coefficient here can be plus one or minus one. That means it can be negative or positive. So when you add two such states, it can happen that they cancel. And this is something that cannot happen to just probabilities. Yeah, probabilities are positive numbers. When you add them, you get uh, some average or whatever. Yeah. Um, so here, uh, certain things can cancel. And uh, later the algorithm will rely on a clever way of creating cancellations and amplifications. So that's, uh, the 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 the, uh, the that's an important thing here. So that's a nice exercise. So maybe you have to go through this a little bit uh, with a little bit more time. That actually this tensor product here corresponds to this um, representation with this coefficient. Yeah, but if you make an example of say a, 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 a three qubit register, you you see what's going on. Yeah, it's just. Uh, counting when do you get um, um, a coefficient with a minus one and do you get an even number? Yeah, the coefficients can move in front. So do you get an even number or an odd number? Yeah, that's the Hadamard gate, a very important thing. Yeah, it creates these nice uh, superpositions uh, in the quantum registers and in the qubit. Another gate operating on two qubits is the phase shift gate. So the phase shift gate just shifts the phase uh, in front and by convention here in front of 
the cat one. So I just have this uh, factor here and it's often uh, just written by uh, writing the angle of this rotation uh, in, 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 in this box, if you draw a circuit. So then we have the controlled uh, knot. You saw this mapping zero, zero to uh, zero, zero, uh, mapping uh, zero, one to zero, one, and then mapping one, zero to one, one. So flipping the third and the second, um, yeah, if you start counting in, 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 in zero uh, basis states. Uh, so a conditional or a controlled uh, knot. And uh, the picture that you uh, have for this, also sometimes called XOR gate, uh, is that there is here the guy where you apply the knot. And there is here the uh, control bit. Yeah? So if that is one, I will apply the knot. If, if not, I will apply the uh, identity. Uh, I believe the convention is that these circuits are drawn with the from, from top to down, yeah, Q0. Um, reading the bits from, from left to right. Yeah. Don't know if there's an issue like big Andean and little Andean here, here too. Yeah. Maybe you have to be a bit careful. Uh, we can also construct a conditional phase shift. Yeah. So it's identity in the upper left and phase shift in the uh, lower right uh, of the matrix. Mm, the conditional phase shift, okay, maybe clear. Um, we can create a swap gate that just swaps the values of the bits. So you see it is just swapping here from there to there, you know, these two. So it's swapping the, the bits, usually this depicted here with this uh, picture, you know, the, the two crosses. And if you would like to have an example for a bit uh, operating on or, or gate operating on a three qubit register, there's the controlled controlled knot. Yeah? So it only applies a knot if both qubits uh, are one. No? So you have a huge identity and then a small knot in, in the corner. These were some example for gates, there are more. Yeah? There will be maybe a nice other session where you see more. Um, we can combine now these guys to uh, circuits and uh, measurements. We draw this here um, as a circuit. And this is now a circuit that creates the so-called bell state. So it will first bring the first guy into uh, superposition. So we create one over square root of two zero plus one over square root of two one for the first bit. And then I will add the controlled knot. So I will make the second bit a one if the first bit was a one. So the controlled knot will then just here copy the, the, the bit to the other side and I will get this superpositioned entangled state, which we uh, were um, observing. So this is called uh, the bell state. Um, and you will later maybe have some experiments where you can ex uh, create this. Uh, so uh, for example, here in uh, Python with Zerg, uh, you see that there can be code that you can create such a circuit. So I take a Hadamard gate, and the C not gate, and then you can print the circuit and simulate this. So if I let this run, uh, you, you have a computer program that you can create and simulate this stuff. No? So here you see um, a nice ASCII chart of the circuit, and you also see the matrix, and you see the probabilities that you are in these two uh, states, zero, zero, and one, one. And now you can repeat measurements and you get, for example, here you get the basis state zero, zero, the first basis state with in 509 cases of 1000 and you get the third, the one, one, cat, cat three, yeah, um, in 500, 
91 cases. So we will look at computer programs later. So a final measurement in the circuit is de depicted by this symbol and that uh, completes the session on gates and the code example in circ is also here in, in the script. Yeah, so that's here a very simple example to create this uh, bell state, this um, entangled state. Yeah, so that was the code that I just ran and you can, you can, you can play with this. Um, maybe I like to take 10 minutes more. Uh, yeah, we, ha we have a very large uh, break. So I like to finish by discussing um, maybe 10 to 15 minutes our first algorithm. Um, I will give you now a discussion of the Krova algorithm. I will get go maybe a little bit quickly over the algorithm because at this point, it's maybe enough to just get the intuition. We will later look at the deutsch josa algorithm where I will also discuss the implementation. I will write down the gates. I will write down explicitly how to do it. Uh, I will skip a few things here. Um, so I explain you the basic idea, but I do not write down exactly uh, how the gates uh, look like. Uh, but this is a very nice example because almost all things that make, uh, that give you the essence of um, a quantum computing algorithm are already in here. And the Korova algorithm is a nice thing to get a first intuition and it solves the problem of inverting um, a function. Well, that's maybe a little bit much because uh, the problem is uh, that we like to solve now is uh, much simplified. So I consider only um, a function that maps uh, a value to either zero and one. So the arguments come from um, zero to n minus one. Uh, for example, the n minus one is now one of my states, basis states in my tensor space. So for example, the n could be two to the power of n if you have n qubits. Huh? So all qubits are mapped to something and the function maps this to zero and one, uh, but uh, all values are maps to, mapped to zero. Only one value is mapped to one. So the function maps f of x to one or zero, and it maps it to one if x is equal to some x star. And the task is to find x star. So I would like to find x star. So in a classical computer, you would have to go through all values and check, is it one? And in the worst case, you need n checks yeah, because it's just the last value. So in an average case, it's maybe n half, but it's still a lot. And this algorithm can, instead of using n half, perform the check in order square root of n he can find the element x star much faster. But now the second ingredient only with a certain probability. So a little bit like in Monte Carlo, yeah? you do not have the result um, exactly. So he can find x star, so that's maybe here a crane of salt, uh, x star only with um, a certain probability, probability one divided by n. But if n is a large number, that is really a small thing and you can improve it by repeating it. Um, well, this function here is not invertible. Yeah? I mentioned this. So we need a unitary operator that somehow encodes the function. And we assume that we have a unitary operator u that has the property that u of x is the identity if x is not x star and it's minus x if x is x star. So uh, I will comment on how we get the u later. So that's a part which I skip now. Uh, just assume that we have this u. And now the thing is that once I have this u, I can find the x star in order square root of n. So we will discuss how to build the unitary operator later. So the Krover algorithm has a nice 
intuitive geometric interpretation. And I will discuss with you more the geometric interpretation. So um, the first thing is that I create the state S, which is the superposition of all basis states with equal probability, with equal weight. So actually, you already know the gate who does this. This is applying Hadamard gate to 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Uh, go back to the slide. Yeah, then every coefficient in front, the minus one is always a one. And it's a superposition. This is, this is applying Hadamard gate to uh, cat uh, zero. So I can write here H applied to uh, cat zero. Well, it's, it's the H applied to everyone. Yeah, so H N. We first create this state. And then now look, this state has a non negative. Uh, or non, sorry, this state has a non-zero scalar product with every basis state. So if you draw now your um, space as being the direction X star and the direction say all states which are orthogonal to X star, then you see that the angle or the scalar product between S and X star is one divided by square root of N. Yeah, clearly, if you do the scalar product, uh, you just single out, you have the scalar product of this vector with a vector that has zero, 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 and somewhere a one, and you just get the one divided by square root of N. So you see the scalar product of this state with our searched state is one divided by square root of N. And you can interpret this as having here some uh, angle. So there is some here alpha. Yeah? And actually this is um, related to, uh, to, the, to the angle um, alpha. Yeah? Okay, so the angle alpha is of order uh, one divided by square root of n. Yeah? So for small angles, it's almost, uh, it's, it's, it's linear. <clears throat> so now if I have the u, so we have the u, and if I have the state s, I can create um, a rotation and the rotation will move uh, our state further to the searched state. And how is this done? So the first thing is that I apply u and u is replacing x star with minus x star. Yeah? So recall uh, u applied to x star is minus x star. So without knowing the state, if I have this transformation, I can achieve something uh, that is related. Yeah? So that has some, some correlation to X star. So, and this will just mirror, this will just mirror the S. So I apply this now to the S to the other side. And now there is another nice rotation. So the second rotation is now um, the operator to cat S pra S minus identity. And this operator is actually mirroring this guy along this line along the, the line S. This is actually mirroring a vector along S. I will explain this uh, in, in a second that this is the case yeah, when the picture has improved, but now just believe this. I, if I apply this unitary operation, then the, the blue vector is flipped to the light green vector on the other side. And now you repeat these two gates. Yeah? Uh, but what have you done? I mean, you have increased the angle uh, by 
actually a factor of two. Yeah, so uh, or three, twice the angle, the original angle, and that is twice the original angle. So every flipping, every flipping is adding another angle. Yeah? So every operation is increasing the angle by um, uh, one divided by uh, square root of n. So now you make the u again. So the next u will flip down the blue one to the light green one. So it is the flipping along this line. And I apply again the uh, two times uh, cat s pra s minus identity, which is flipping along this line yeah, to the other side. And I repeat this. And how many times do I repeat this? I repeat each gate. Uh, so I repeat this for one divided by square root of n is the angle. Square root of n actually half yeah because every second uh, uh, every everyone um, uh, so I have two two operations so I order order n squared times I repeat this order n squared times and I arrive at my desired state and then I just measure the system so the system will reveal the search state so I have performed transformations such that the system will reveal the search state. And how many transformations do I need? I uh, need um, uh, order uh, square root of n uh, steps. Uh, maybe just here at this picture illustrate that this here is the uh, right uh, uh, transformation. Yeah, so uh, you know that this operator is a projection um, of a vector onto the um, S. Yeah? So actually this is uh, how much does this blue line have a component into the S. Calculate this guy here and move twice in this direction. So you have uh, one identity. Yeah, so this guy here is S uh, plus an identity. So you have um, one identity minus two times S plus an identity. And that's then um, two times cat S pra S minus one identity. Okay, that's, that's maybe nice, nice explanation. So this guy here is S is minus um, identity. Okay, so let's uh, 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 so let's finish here the core algorithm. So we continue this uh, process, and in the end, we arrived at the search state. So um, compared to uh, a classical algorithm, um, we would need uh, order in steps and our algorithm uh, requires only order square root of n operations. Uh, so a clever uh, transformation creating this amplification. Uh, so only square root of n steps to create this amplification. But also in this algorithm, there is the thing that we can only measure the result with a certain probability. So why is that remark uh, that um, we reveal, so why is that remark that we reveal the result only with a certain uh, probability? Well, um, square root of n is maybe not an integer. So it's not guaranteed that we are exactly at the output state. Yeah? So it could be that uh, square root of n is um, not an integer. So if we make the last step, we are a little bit before the state. If we make another step, we are a little bit behind. Yeah? So there is a gap between these two and this gap has size uh, one divided by n. So we, um, uh, one divided by n squared, uh, square root of n. And then if you take the probability, uh, the probability is one divided by n. 
Yeah? So um, there is a probability of one divided by um, n that you miss the, the, uh, the output state. A small remark, it, the algorithm looks a little bit like cheating. Yeah? Don't you think so? The, uh, I mean, uh, because we have this op operator u. I mean, if you have this operator u, you already know the state. So what's that? Uh, so, um, however, we do not make use of this. And also in a classical computer program, um, you have this case. So assume that you have a classic program that evaluates your function uh, magically in parallel, and you get the output vector of your function immediately. Then you have not solved the problem because you have to check all the output values. Where is the one? And that's the same case here with my u. We have this u, it performs everything in parallel, but the essence of this algorithm is not that I have this u. The essence is that um, I need square root of n steps to perform the check. So uh, you might think that this looks a little bit like cheating because you have this operator which immediately sees the state. However, um, you cannot in the quantum computer make uh, use of this that we immediately see the state. We have to transform the system and then perform a measurement. And we can perform this uh, transformation um, to the uh, amplific amplified superposition in uh, square root of n uh, steps. That's that's a nice uh, nice thing, yeah. That describes a little bit the essence how the algorithms um, are, are different, and also the fact that uh, we only get the result with a certain probability. So maybe you have to repeat your measurements to get some confidence. What is the uh, what is the right uh, value? So a Monte Carlo simulation, yeah. So a repetition around the experiments is often often part of of such an algorithm. So um, a small summary, some misconceptions and then we are done. So it's a misconception that the qubit can take a continuum of values. If we perform a measurement, it takes only one of the two states. So, but it may be in superposition. Same uh, for um, um, a quantum register. A quantum register does not have more states than a classical register, uh, but it can represent all two to the power of n states in uh, superposition. So having in mind this misconception that the qubit takes a continuum of values, one might think that the Cartesian product of this continuum would be the right thing. No, this is not the case because we have entanglement. It is the tensor space and the tensor space is much larger. So we have all to the, to the power of n classical states in in uh, in our superposition hidden. Then there is maybe the misconception that we have two to the power of n different states with different probabilities and the measurement singles out just one of these guys, but the superposition is a linear combinations with coefficients in C and these coefficients may cancel. And it is this interference in a high dimensional space, which allows very nice, very high performance algorithm. And this guy we just saw just has an improvement square root of N. We will see another one in the next session, which has an exponential improvement. So instead of two to the power of N, we need N steps much better. Um, yeah, so it's log, log, log n uh, instead of square root of uh, capital N. Um, and this is making use of the fact that the coefficients can cancel. 
So I hope that this was a nice first uh, introduction, giving you some intuition into quantum computing. And we will continue with uh, a session on more topics and also more algorithms. And later the day you have then uh, some, some nice uh, coding experiments. <laughs>